cut all this shit out. All right. Um, who are you? Who are you? Who am I talking to right now? What do you want to know about? Me? What do you want to? So, like documentaries, I wouldn't really say are quite industrial films, but these documentaries that I'm going to talk about have a lot of industrial filmmaking in them. I brought this book. I'll show the camera too. This book is a perfect example of what the creative process looks like and what all these films that I'm going to talk about have taught me about how to make stuff. Essentially, the point is that all these films I'm going to talk about today are, are they showcase the creative process and they also are a showcase of new technology and engineering. But also, they both, they all, they all demonstrate this idea that art and science are one and the same. So I'm going to start with really the start of my creative journey is this film called the Pixar Shorts, A Short History, which was a documentary on the special features of the Pixar Shorts Volume 1 DVD that I got as a child in 2007. So I love this documentary because it really covers the early days of Pixar in the 80s struggling to transform themselves from a computer company into a film company. These guys were mavericks. They were pioneers. And pioneers, there's a clip in the... In the there was a kind of pioneer spirit. Like we're out in the wilderness uh, making our own roads and there's really nobody to help. Proof that enduring the pain of creating something from nothing is not only worth it, but it's essential. We need it for, any, for all good things that happen in the world. The next story I'm gonna talk about is called the Pixar story, um, and it's directed and written by Leslie Iwerks, who is the granddaughter of Ub Iwerks, who famously created the very first Steamboat Willie cartoon. Um, this one is about all of the feature films leading up to Cars. They didn't even know what kind of company they were or what they were really trying to accomplish because it was all experimentation. Pixar was famously founded by three guys. The dream that John Lasseter had when he was a kid, he got a book called The Art of Animation. He saw that book and much like me, when I saw Pixar shorts, he said, that's what I want to do. You can actually, oh, that's a job that exists. Eventually, after going to CalArts, which was the pipeline for Disney animators and Disney artists, John Lasseter made several short films, hand-drawn short films, and he won some Academy Awards for them. Eventually, he did end up getting a job for Disney, and they had him working on this project, The Brave Little Toaster. To him, computer animation was not only the cutting edge of technology, but it was an exciting new tool to be able to tell stories with. Okay, it's time to show the head of the studio at the time, Brave Little Toaster. And he stood up and he asked, well, how much is this going to cost? I said, well, it's... It's with computer animation. It's, it's going to be, you know, no more than the the, uh, the regular budget of a, of a film. And he went, the only reason to do computer animation is if it makes it, if we can do it faster or cheaper. And he walked up and he, he walked out. And it was like, what? You know? And um, so about five minutes later, I get this call. And Ed Hansen calls me down to his office. And... Um, I come down, and he said, well, John, your project is now complete, so your, your employment with the Disney Studios is now terminated. Uh, Brave Little Toaster gets shelved, and it never is released. Um, and John Lasseter, who had realized his childhood dream of working for the Disney Studios, is crushed. Pixar at the time was the computer division of Lucasfilm. So their job was to produce uh, technology that would be useful in making films. So, so the way they made money was by selling these computers and they had a really limited market. George Lucas, George Lucas ends up selling Pixar, the Pixar computer division to Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs saw before anyone else that the potential of computer generated films was astronomical. Okay, no business plan, no here's how we're gonna get our money back, none of that. He just bought it. He was bankrolling all of Pixar. 
Ed Catmull had recruited John Lasseter to be an animator at Pixar because in order to make their showcase better, they wanted to get an in-house animator who was an artist. So they recruited John Lasseter and, and that's how they started making the first shorts. And those films put Pixar on the map. Ed Catmull had a dream of making the very first computer animated feature film. He, keep in mind, this whole time the company is just hemorrhaging money. Steve Jobs bankrolled all these guys for years while they figured out what they were going to be. All of these people were worried that they were going to lose their jobs and that the company was going to fail. Trying to make a feature film in the 70s and 80s was completely nuts because the computers at the time were way too slow. Back when we were working on our very first films, it was a challenge to make even a single image in computer graphics. Putting in all-nighters all the time, motivated in a way that you never see. Motivation you almost never see anywhere in the face of constant risk. And eventually, they got to the point where they made the first feature film, which was Toy Story. And Toy Story shattered every box office record when it came out. And for a long time, they called it the Pixar effect. Brad Bird talks about it in the documentary. Kate, nice to see you. Again. I'm here to tell you, you guys are kind of in your uh, wood fired pizza mode, and a lot of you were. <laughs> yeah! I work at the place where we make hit after hit. <laughs> but, you know, I'm telling you, I'm, I've been out in the real world, as some of you also have been, and, and you who have been out there know what I'm talking about. This is an anomaly. This place is a really freakishly alone in this hit after hit aspect and and two um, uh, you know these kind of projects don't happen that often grab this opportunity and run with it you know film is forever you know pain is temporary <laughs> it was like they couldn't lose they were making the highest quality product on the market and they were raking it in the Pixar story is unbelievably good at, and one of the most best line that's in there I included in my other art pushes technology and technology inspires the art. All right, so I go and see Tim's Vermeer. Tim's Vermeer is directed by Teller of Penn and Teller, Tim Jennison. Tim Jennison is a uh, entrepreneur, he's a technologist, and he's a tinkerer. The other thing about Tim, Tim Jennison is a software entrepreneur. So The dude is a genius. The premise of this film is Tim Jennison is trying to solve the mystery of why Johannes Vermeer was able to paint these ultra photorealistic images. Vermeer paintings looked like they were like they were photographs. They looked like they came out of a video camera. David Hockney's uh, hypothesis was that he was using technology to help him create these paintings. So they, they talk about the camera obscura and they run a bunch of experiments to see how it is that Vermeer may have done this. Tim Jennison makes a commitment that in order to solve the mystery of how Vermeer painted these paintings, he is going to paint a Vermeer himself. With zero training, never having picked up a paintbrush, he creates a 3D model of <laughs> the room that appears in Vermeer's The Music Lesson. He recreates a perfect replica of that room. He grinds his own lenses. He mixes his own pigments because he wanted to stay true to the technology that was available at the time. Tim Jennison starts messing around with a comparator, which is a small mirror that you can uh, put above the canvas you're working at, that if you look at it, you can see a reference image that you have next to it. And once you get the color that exactly matches your reference image, the edge of the mirror disappears. And if you do this process for long enough, you will, with enough time and enough effort, create a perfect replica of your reference image. And then he realizes that, you know, that, that it, it can't have been just that. So he, he uses this combination of a convex mirror and a giant lens. Along the way, he discovers all of these coincidences that just prove to him more and more that this is very likely what Vermeer used. And he does it. 
he completes this painting. He completes a perfect replica of the music lesson. And this guy is a tinkerer. And tinkerers, I believe, really are capable of almost anything. That's the biggest takeaway I have from all of these films. It's truly a, a masterful documentary. Okay. Probably about three years ago, I went to the Guild Cinema in Albuquerque and uh, just on a whim, like I did with a lot of these films, I went to see this movie called Clay Dream. The story of Will Vinton Studios. But I had never heard of Will Vinton. This documentary is about technology, it's about entrepreneurship, and it's about business. Clay Dream, okay. Will Vinton, he had gone to art school in Berkeley. He had, you know, dipped in the psychedelic culture of the 60s. And then he bought a small house in Portland and turned it into animation studio. He, okay, and he would invite people over and they'd smoke some pot and drink some beers and they would make animations. He had a partner called Bob Gardner and together they made a film called Closed Mondays, which won an Academy Award. Starting an animation studio in a house, by any means, work with what you have. Don't have to break in. Will Vinton didn't go to CalArts, all right? But Will Vinton's idol was Walt Disney. One of the most famous things that the Will Vinton Studios is known for is California Raisins were an ad campaign and they put Will Vinton on the map as a advertising company and really as an animation company. There are also some narrative stuff. There was a film called The Adventures of Mark Twain. It, it, he turned it from a bunch of weirdos in a garage to a, a, a property, a campus, and really had started to affect the economy of Portland. Uh, and animators were moving there from all over the country. One, the other part of this story that is crucial, that makes this film really just over the top great to me is they go very deep into the story of Will Vinton's relationship with Phil Knight. Nike was also based in Portland, so Will Vinton was looking for investors and ended up finding one in Phil Knight. And they fell on hard times. I would say because of the organizational and managerial decisions that Will Vinton made for his company. His animators were starting to get disgruntled because they were overworked and they weren't receiving credit. Their deals started to fall apart. They had uh, some TV shows that they were trying to get picked up for more seasons. They all got turned down. He got fired. He got fired from the company he founded. He got, And then he sued Phil Knight. And a big part of this documentary is footage from, their, uh, from the deposition. It's, it's a million dollars worth of game. Because to me, Will Vinton is like the Lewin Davis of animation. The, the man had bigger aspirations than almost anybody. He wanted to become Walt Disney. He wanted to turn downtown Portland into a theme park. And he was, get, he was gonna get there, right? But these decisions ended up killing the whole thing. Will Vinton was not a bad businessman, but when it came to a fight between him and Phil Knight, there was no contest. He was out, he was gonna lose. The dream died. These are mistakes you don't, no one knows about. No one knows what it takes to try and do something like he did. Will Vinton, who is now passed, uh, wasn't bitter about the way it ended. He changed the trajectory of his life and he found fulfillment somewhere else. To me, this is like a, this movie's like a masterclass in how to do business. Will Vinton Studios created an amazing body of work that, you know, is just exceptional. It's some of the most exceptional stop motion ever. And I would recommend this film to anybody who's interested in entrepreneurship or animation or art or, um, or anything like that. Okay, the next one is called Eames, the Architect and Painter. Okay, so this is the story of Charles and Ray Eames, um, husband and wife, architect, painter, uh, power couple, creative uh, powerhouse. Probably the most famous thing that they're recognized for is the Eames chair. They came up with the revolutionary technology of bending plywood and creating these compound curves in plywood. And then they got a contract with Herman Miller, um, which meant that they were making a lot of money. Alongside making, designing those chairs, alongside designing their their house in Los Angeles, alongside designing 
buildings, making paintings. They were also making films, okay? And you can see these films on YouTube. They're unbelievably good because they cover so many different topics, everything from uh, like arithmetic, ancient Rome, American history, and some, some are just art films. Like they're just, they have one called Tops and it's just, different kinds of tops. They just film all different types of tops. They were, they were tinkerers, they were experimenters. What happens if we try this? Why don't we go learn about that topic? Curiosity was bottomless. One, one of the best lines in this documentary is, when they were hiring folks to work at the studio, they had a very simple test to see if you were the kind of person who would do well there. And what Charles would say is, if you can think and you can see, and you can show me that. You can show me that you can think and see. Then you can work here. And I don't care what your experience is. I don't care what your background is, right? Tim Vermeer, Tim Jennison could think and he could see, right? But he couldn't paint, you know? And that is what sets the tinkerer apart. The tinkerer is somebody who says, let me try it, even though they have no experience, even though it might be intimidating, even though what they are trying to do might be something that's really advanced and difficult. It doesn't stop them from trying to do it, right? So Charles and Ray Eames, their whole studio operated this way. And it's one of the reasons why so much incredible work came out of that studio. Keep in mind also that this is in the 50s. This isn't Silicon Valley. This isn't Y Combinator looking for people with new ideas. This, these are some people who were operating in one of the cons most conservative times in America. They made a killer business deal so that they could creatively express themselves in whatever way they wanted. Um, also, you know, it's just a beautiful piece of work, this documentary. So sh shout out Jason Kahn. Moving on, moving on. We got Jay myself. Jay. This film is another one like Clay Dream that I saw at the Guild Cinema just because I just showed up that day. I had no idea what this film was. This man, Jay Mizell, who is a legendary uh, photographer, he's famous for, he took the photo of Miles Davis that's on the cover of Kind of Blue. He took a ton of the Blue Note photos of like all these amazing jazz legends. For, I have to give a shout out to this guy, Stephen Wilkes, who directed this movie because he's such, he did such a great job on this film. He's a student of Jay Mizell and he includes a lot of his personal life story into this film. And it's just, it's just profound. In 1966, a 35 year old Jay Maisel purchases the Germania Bank Building in the Bowery of New York City, which is a six story bank. And he buys this building in 1966 for $100,000. I just want, let's just, that's the most interesting thing about this is that he bought this building and he turned it into his studio and he lived in it alone. I'm talking about one guy living in a six story building with 72 rooms. He would fill these rooms with artifacts. He would collect things profusely. Got everything color coded and organized. He's got his whole photography studio with his contact sheets and his archives. He got these amazing views of the city around him. And it was just such a large building that he was able to take these amazing street photos of New York um, that are legendary now. Um, and the film is really about, he's gotten to an age where he, he can't continue to live in this building anymore and he's got to move out and it's just this insane task. Stuff, this is 50 years worth of stuff, all right? So at the same time, he's reconnecting with Stephen Wilkes and they're talking about his career, talking about photography, talking about design. He had trained with Joseph Albers and also, but really it's about his approach to creating stuff and his approach to art, his approach to looking at stuff. An amazing entrepreneurial story. I mean, the idea of a 36 year old kid purchasing a six story building in New York City is just unheard of. There's no precedent for that. I, I don't think anyone will get to that after him. The music's great, the, the photos are great, and Stephen Wilkes made an absolutely amazing, amazing movie here. Okay, the, there, there are behind the scenes on Fantastic Mr. Fox. They're included on the Criterion. I originally had them on the regular Blu-ray. On the Criterion, they're called the Publicity Featurettes. So these are um, documentaries where Bill Murray was walking around the studio in, uh, in London 
while they were working on Fantastic Mr. Fox and talking to the animators, talking to the people fabricating the puppets, you know, talking to people working on cameras, and uh, they're just an unbelievably great document of what it took to make that movie and also just the process of making a stop motion film, okay? So I would absolutely suggest these films to anybody interested in stop motion or filmmaking. When I was a kid, I used to watch these on loop and just wish, just that's where I want to be. I wish I was on that team. I wish that was my fucking job, you know? Like, it's what I was one of the most... Uh, it was one of my favorite times. Shorts is there's a se segment where Bill Murray goes and he talks to this animator who's a very old Japanese woman um, who's being very, very precise as she's animating the sewer sequence in Fantastic Mr. Fox. And she is just glowing. They're having such a great time on that. Uh, the publicity featurettes on Fantastic Mr. Fox to me were essential. They're, they're, they're a great, great creative process film. Okay, Waking Sleeping Beauty. This is an amazing movie because it's really about the story of the revival of the animation department in Disney. Um, right now I'm reading the biography of Walt Disney by Neil Gabler. And um, they're talking about Snow White, the first push to try and make Snow White. And that's when they really built the first... That's when they first built the animation building at, at the Disney Studios. Okay. And let's just remember that Disney... Disney was founded as an animation company. The way that they made their money was by making and distributing animated films, okay? And that's how they made all their money before they even made the first feature, right? But when they made Snow White, that's when they really expanded. And this was unprecedented. This was much like Pixar, where people thought that CG was a niche, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a phase. That's what people thought about animation. It was a novelty. It was, um, you know, something for kids. It was something that you watched before you came to see the movie that you actually came to see, right? Um, but Disney saw the potential. He was like, uh oh, this is so powerful that it can actually, it, it can affect the economy. It can change the world. So they built this campus and the biggest investment was in their animators. Walt Disney made such an effort of making sure that he got the best animators, that he made sure that they wanted to stay on the team, you know, he wanted to make sure that they were taken care of, and he ran the place like an engineer. He ran the studio like a someone who was trying to get to space, right? The animation department of Disney had gotten their funding cut, which is insane to even imagine that they would cut the funding for the animation department at Disney, but they did, and the film suffered because of it. Fox and the Hound is one of them where there was uh, and there were advances in technology that happened way before Fox and the Hound that gave these films a really deep dimensional look. And the Fox and the Hound actually looked a lot worse because they cut the funding for the animation. And Michael Eisner replaced Ron Miller as CEO. And Michael Eisner is, was a great, great visionary businessman. So the films that came after Michael Eisner returned the funding to the animation department. They were like the second golden age of Disney. And the reason I love this story so much is because it's about watching, you know, this legacy company that's been around for 50 years already, has so much going for it, so much money involved, so much interest, but for some reason, it's not producing the results people want from it. And um, this story is important to me because like the Will Vinton story, it showcases a lot of these business decisions that ended up making all of these great films possible. So Waking Sleeping Beauty, absolutely suggest this film. It's a, it's a wonderful documentary. The last, last film I'm going to create a process film I'm going to talk about. David Sproxton and Peter Lord founded Aardman Animations, and much like the story of Pixar, the story of Will Vinton Studios, the story of Disney, the story of... It was some tinkerers sitting around in a garage fucking around, right? There's this series on YouTube called Our Docs, okay? And it covers all the history of Aardman Animations from the very early uh, Lord and Sproxton films to when they first met Nick Park and he... Uh, joined the company and um, created all the Wallace and Gromit films. 
and then their efforts into advertising, their efforts into TV, uh, their feature films, and it includes a lot of the business uh, decisions that they made. And but really, the most the coolest thing about it is that you see the history of this company evolving, right? And you see that the power of these two guys uh, tinkering in a garage can lead to all this amazing potential. And Ardman Animations is still around today. They're still making stuff people love. And they're a successful company out in, in Bristol. So to me, they are totally aligned in this same story as Tinkerers. And, uh, and so I would recommend these. Art Docs is another creative process film. Again, the thing I really want to express about these, these process films is that they highlight tinkering and experimenting and building something from scratch, building it from the ground up, um, creative vision and, and uh, you know, auto, being an autodidact, teaching yourself things, existing in many different fields, existing and working in many different fields and, and passion driving the whole thing, right? passion for what you want to see in the world and the things that brought you joy, the things that inspired you as, as a creator, those things pushing you towards an unknown potential, right? Thrusting you into the unknown with motivation that, that you've never seen anywhere else. You know, I, the, these stories are about people who risk so much and excel you know, who really do such a damn good job that I just am so, so endlessly inspired by all of these films. And, um, and I wouldn't be the filmmaker I am now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, the, I wouldn't have the mind I have now if it wasn't for these, right? Each one of these films totally changed the direction of my life. They, and I hope to contribute to these, to this genre in my lifetime. Thank you for watching. Thank you for having me here. And I'm glad I was able to share this with y'all.